We have a lot of new faces. This is fantastic. So I'm, I'm glad to see this. Hey, Aaron. Aaron Bodner. Let's get settled in because we've got a, a, a big agenda here and we're, we're just coming right up on time. So uh, glad to have everyone here. This is fantastic. Uh, beautiful sort of fall day. Uh, I think that, that's a little impetus to, to get involved. Hey, Todd. How are you, sir? <laughs> Good to see you. All right. Well, uh, as always, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and joining us. Uh, this should be another great uh, presentation for Hyperledger Seattle uh, Meetup. Uh, my name is Rich Block, uh, and uh, we have a great crew here to help you. And of course, Chris Banton is here from T-Mobile, uh, and we'll be hearing from Chris momentarily. So first off, we want to say thanks uh, to all the folks that helped to make this happen. So thanks to our sponsors, so thanks to T-Mobile for sponsoring this event, and a little bit about T-Mobile, and as if we don't know about them. How many people have T-Mobile phones? All right, is Chris watching? All right, good, good. <laughs> That's low. All right, T-Mobile is transforming the wireless industry through technology innovation by taking the powerful tools they've allowed us to develop N-scale solutions in the cloud and sharing them with the world. We're helping to bring everyone forward together. Are you with us? So thank you, T-Mobile, for helping to sponsor the event. And then where is Aaron, our co-organizer? Where'd Aaron go? Oh, there he is, Aaron. Thank you. So thanks to Aaron uh, Bodmer. He is the reason why we're here. Uh, he works uh, just down the hall. Uh, and so that's the reason why we're able to use this facility for zero cost. Well, it's, it's a cost to, to Aaron because we pester him all the time for his help. But thank you, Aaron, and, and CoMotion, uh, UW CoMotion Labs for making this happen. Thank you so much. Okay, community announcements. So uh, I wanted to report out. So we're getting towards the end of the year, uh, and I wanted to share a little bit of information about the health of our meetup here. Uh, and, and we just had a meeting yesterday with, with the co-organizers. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, since February of 2018, which is when we sort of rebooted this, this meetup, uh, we are up to 650 members, which is great. In fact, it continues to roll. I haven't even checked today. Uh, our, gro our membership grew over 120%, which is more than double, so thank you for all that. Uh, we grow at about 1.6 members per day, which is pretty fascinating. <laughs> I don't know who that 0.6 is. It sounds painful. Uh, our active membership grew over 360%. So not only are we growing, but we're growing more involved as a community here, uh, and that to me is fantastic. Uh, and so uh, on that point, as we continue to grow out, we're putting together next year's survey that'll come out shortly, and what that'll do is that'll help to sort of set, uh, sort of set our, our sort of vector, our velocity for next year. Uh, we're suspecting it'll be very similar to what we've done over the past eight months. Uh, and we may vary it up a little bit, uh, but the idea is that we are here to serve you as a community as it relates to Hyperledger and blockchain in general. Uh, and in fact, there, a lot of these presentations, though they sort of are Hyperledger hyper sort of trademarked, uh, obviously many of us are very new to the, to, to the technology and so we're trying to, trying to meter that and we're, tr we're trying to be as general as we can in cases where we can be. Uh, and of course, we tend to go deep when we have someone very technical and willing to go deep as well. Um, so uh, regarding H HSM leadership, uh, so one of our organizers um, moved on. Jeff Pasek resigned his position earlier or late in September uh, due to ongoing work uh, issues or commitments, I should say. Uh, but I'm happy to also announce that we have two new co-organizers taking over and Marissa. Marissa, you want to say hello? and. So Marissa is program manager with uh, Forum Solutions. Uh, her background's in healthcare. Uh, when Marissa is not helping out with HSM here, uh, she's leading the HLHCWG, so Hyperledger Healthcare Working Group, uh, patient member subgroup. I got that right. Blah. Uh, which is an international group of technology and medical professionals using Hyperledger to solve problems in the healthcare sector. So thank you, Marissa. And she is fantastic, by the way, and I, I just underscore that. She's absolutely amazing in what she does. So we're very lucky to have her here 
uh, I think this, this meetup will just continue to grow very well because of her. Uh, and then Aaron, uh, all the way at the back, we just heard from Aaron before. Uh, he is now also one of our, our co-organizers as well. Uh, and he also, with, with, with beyond helping just here, he's also the founder and CEO of a startup that he's got called eboro.io, uh, which is a startup developing blockchain-based network, uh, a blockchain-based network for the renewable energy industry. And you're using fabric, I think? Yes. Definitively. <laughs> right on. Uh, and as I mentioned, he's also our sort of our, our venue master here uh, at CoMotion. Okay, uh, time for a raffle. So, uh, who was here last time when we did our raffle? All right. So, <laughs> oh, by the way, this is by the way, this is my wife Diane in the back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to get in trouble for that. Uh, so uh, if you notice on your tags, you have a number. So we're going to raffle off uh, two items today. Uh, we have a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> we have a t-shirt and we have a Hyperledger, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, a tumbler? Or... It's insulated. It's actually very nice. So OK, so we're going to, I'm going to Run, run the little number thing here, and I'm going to call out a number, and it's 164. So who's got 164? So you may have to look at your neighbor. 164? Once it would be right on here. Anybody? 164? No. All right. 107. Yay! <laughs> That's how you know your neighbor. Uh, and it was Allison? Yes. Come on up. Uh, do you want the tumbler thingy or the t-shirt? I'll, I'll let you decide. Both are quite nice. Uh, see, will it fit? <laughs> oh, perfect. OK. <laughs> the, the, we made the decision for you. <laughs> all right, all right. So we've got the tumbler thingy, which is very nice. How about 117? Nobody? Okay. And it could be me. I'm not going to even look. Uh, 162. Oh, boy. All right. We'll keep going. 131. Where are all these people? <laughs> Too bad. 187. Oh, yay. Oh, we have, a, we have a new person. All right. There you go. And your name is T Ted? Teddy, oh, congratulations. Is this your first time uh, here? Yeah. All right, cool. See, you, you come, you get free stuff. Yeah. You got to come back later. All right. Well, good. OK, so, uh, so a couple of community announcements. Uh, our next on-site meeting uh, is going to be with Drummond Reed. And Drummond is uh, in the audience already. He loves it here so much. Uh, Drummond will, uh, is from Evernem. He's presenting on. Governance Frameworks, Business, Legal, and Technical Policies for Blockchains, uh, presenting the Sovereign Governance Framework version 2. The governance framework for the sovereign blockchain is a global public utility for self-sovereign identity. So that's next month, 11-6, uh, which is a Tuesday, 4 to 6, same location. So, and Drummond, you were here in July, I want to say, and spoke uh, to membership, and you were fantastic, so we're thrilled to have you back. Uh, okay. Oh, so he's the man. <laughs> you can't go much further than that. That's great. So that, uh, yeah. yeah, well, we've got a good audience, so I'm sure that we'll all help collectively. Yeah, awesome. OK, and then uh, coming up uh, in December, uh, we'll be, and this is tentative. We're working out the details. Alturos uh, will be coming to speak uh, on a topic. Uh, we're not quite sure, probably fabric-based. Uh, they're a consulting group. I think they're more, they, they work with Cloud Foundry, if folks are familiar with Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then in theory, in early 2019, ArcBlock.io will be here and very likely change healthcare. Uh, and I think change healthcare will be the very first healthcare related uh, hyper ledger uh, speaker uh, that'll be in front of this membership. So I'm thrilled because my, my background's in healthcare. Are they local or are they going to uh, Change? Uh, we actually have someone local here, so that's fantastic. 
Uh, open community announcements. Uh, we have a, uh, an IoT and security blockchain hackathon happening October 27th and 28th. That's at the Wells Fargo Center in Seattle, Washington. Anyone familiar with that? Mark is. Chris is. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I forget about that. Yeah. So that's sponsored through the Blockchain Society and Deutsche Telekom. Well, that's why Chris is there. Uh, the, it's, it's their Innovations Lab. Is that what that is? The T-Labs? So, and and uh, and I don't. Do you know what it costs to to get involved offhand? Ooh, I don't know, but I think there's like four or five thousand dollars of uh, giveaways. So here's here's a great thing that's happened. Like $7, I think. Oh, you you blew it, Todd. Okay. So here's what's really great. Very last minute, we got five free passes to participate. So the first five people that want to get involved, come see me. Uh, this just happened literally about an hour ago, so, um, and I, I don't recall the person that, that contacted me on that. Uh, but anyway, that's happening at the end of the month. Uh, and then finally, uh, Token Forum Blockchain Collaboration Conferences happening November 9th at the Columbia Tower Club. Uh, and Marissa, did, you went to the last one, right? Yes. Fantastic, wonderful. Was really fantastic. Oh, good. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, oh, did I? Oh. Was it Misha? Yeah. Right on. Okay, cool. Uh, so we have a, and I think I sent an email out to, to membership on this. We get a $50 discount uh, if you use our discount code. So if you don't know about that, check your email. Otherwise, come see me and I'll give you the, the code. Uh, and then, like I said, that's uh, November 9th at the Columbia Tower Club. And that's, uh, if to, to go to the URL, it's the tokenforum.com. Okay, on to the presentation. Yes, Marisa. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. When is that happening? <laughs> you want to hit me with that? It's the, anyone wants to just drive over to, to Switzerland? Uh, yes, Drummond. Oh, good God. And Ben will be done. Oh, and we were just talking about that, Ben. You're right. Okay. And Marissa will be there. Drummond will be there. Chris, you, you, you were invited, but you may not be able to go. We'll see. I would love to be there. Everybody should make an effort to go. It's going to be fantastic. Okay. Sovereign sponsors. Oh, okay. Yay, for Sovereign. <laughs> and Helen is our, our sort of our representative for Sovereign Foundation for folks that want to know more about Sovereign. And Drummond? Marketing. Oh, marketing. Even better. <laughs> okay. All right, on to Chris's presentation. T-Mobile's next directory in the business of identity. Uh, so Chris Branton leads blockchain efforts for T-Mobile. We envisioned and architected the next directory, T-Mobile's next generation identity and access management platform built on Hyperledger Sawtooth. Right. Uh, Hyperledger contributor, he's author of the recently announced certified Hyperledger Sawtooth administrator exam. Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, and has spoken on blockchain technologies around the world. Uh, Chris is also Vice President of the Government Blockchain Association, or GBA, Seattle, uh, and is passionate about helping to make Seattle the greatest blockchain community in the world. And that is outstanding because I think we are really on our way uh, to making that happen. So th thank you, Chris. And I'm going to hand this over to you. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Fantastic. Well, uh, so I want to make sure, let's see, I, I've shown some of these slides in other presentations before. So if you've seen me speak at some of the events recently, maybe you'll, some of this will be a little bit familiar. But I am going to do a unique, never-before-seen version of this presentation. And uh, I want it to be pretty interactive, right? We've got a great opportunity to be here and have the Hyperledger Seattle Meetup sponsoring us and bringing great people out to talk about technologies that they're working with. So I'm really excited to have kind of done a, a unique version of this presentation and want to have an opportunity for dialogue with folks. So I know um, Rich asked the question earlier. I saw a bunch of hands go up, but uh, we've got some T-Mobile customers in the audience. Let's see. All right, let me, let me just give a few of these out. All right, yeah. 
There you go. So it's not Tuesday, but for those of you who are T-Mobile customers, you know on Tuesdays we give things away. So that's a pretty cool thing to do. Every Tuesday there's a, a big giveaway. We've got an app for that. But I'm going to give away uh, some of these T-Mobile tumblers through the session today. So uh, participation is what will earn it for you. Ask a question. Um, make a comment. Let's have some kind of order here and not just go crazy with these. But um, I'd love to have you guys engage as I go through this and, and make this a compelling uh, process for everybody. So maybe uh, one more from the audience, any T-Mobile customers or anybody. What's your favorite thing about T-Mobile? Anything you've heard, a feature, a service? Yeah. Love it, love it. And that lines well. One more. I love how when I travel, it just says welcome to wherever I'm That's it, that's <laughs> it, right? So you know then that if you're traveling around North America, it's as good as being here in the United States. If you're in Canada, Mexico, everything works just the way it does here. And wherever I go around the world, you know, I'm able to just get on and use my phone and call an Uber when I get to the airport. That's a fantastic thing. So we definitely love that. Uh, one of my favorite things about T-Mobile is when I get a call uh, from a scammer and what pops up on my phone, it says scam likely. Uh, that's fantastic. Same thing for telemarketers. So I see some other hands. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into the conversation a little bit here and kick off, but please feel free to engage as we go on. I'd, I'd love to have you all um, be a part of this and, and we'll get some tumblers handed out. So. Um, thank you for the introduction, Rich. Appreciate you having us out. Uh, as, as mentioned, I'm Chris Fanton. Um, I, I do a lot of blockchain around T-Mobile. Uh, this is something that T-Mobile has, you know, you can imagine like um, any big enterprise when you look at kind of what, what people talk about around blockchain. You look at things like supply chain, you look at fintech, you look at, um, you might have heard IoT is emerging, uh, identity management, governance. These are all things that many large enterprises, T-Mobile included, can really benefit from solutions that improve uh, the efficiency of what we're doing in that space, can reduce costs, and potentially you know, deliver new um, revenue streams or services. So we are interested in blockchain because of the you know, kind of long-term capabilities and potentials of leveraging this in enterprise architectures. And that's something that I'll definitely talk about today. Uh, we're going to start fairly um, high level and not talk too much tech. I think I put this at one to two stars, so we'll start at the one. And, uh, but we'll get a little bit later into enterprise architecture and how I layer Hyperledger Sawtooth into an overall application architecture to take advantage of the capabilities of that system. Um, but you know, it's important, I think, for me to highlight that you know, blockchain isn't everything in many enterprise applications, or maybe any. Right? It's, it's a part of the solution space. And so we look at the characteristics that this can apply to our application at the end of the day and see how that might fit into the architecture. Um, so blockchain and the business of identity. <laughs> Quick sidebar, one more about T-Mobile. And I want to be clear too, I'm not selling anything today. I, I don't sell anything at T-Mobile. Um, this is a bunch of open source software we give away. I work at a group called the Cloud Center of Excellence and we make tools. T-Mobile has had an opportunity over the last few years to kind of uh, change the way people think about us. Uh, some of the features that you guys heard talked about from the people in the audience are a big part of that. But um, we also um, make open source software. You know, we've got a big company that has a lot of tough challenges as far as technology infrastructure goes. And so we started building solutions to address those challenges and then decided in the last year or so that, you know what's really cool is that we have these things. You know what's even cooler is if we give these away to people. So we've started doing that. We've started open sourcing all these technologies. You'll see them coming out into the market as time goes by. Um, Jazz Serverless is a really cool serverless development infrastructure. You can use it to ease the process of deploying serverless applications in, in your environment. This is something that's open source. You can go check it out today. Um, Conductor is a container platform um, that uh, handles a lot of the kind of complexities of managing containers at scale and across a number of different um, solution spaces. Uh, Pac-Man is really cool. Actually, we've just open sourced this one. We released this as PacBot. Somebody got Pac-Man before us. I don't know where it came from. Um, Pac-Man is not a game. This is a policy and compliance manager or policy as code manager. Um, this is really cool. This is something that we use to manage our cloud infrastructure where we run tens of thousands of unique server instances every month and where we you know, have a, a massive um, uh, containerized workload and a very significant serverless workload, right? Those are important things to us. And so we use Pac-Man to manage all of those assets, gain insights, drive intelligence, take action on risks and security threats. So some really cool open source software that we use to run our business and we're giving it away. So 
It's really cool to be a part of this team. Um, the main highlight of what I'm talking about today is called Next Directory, uh, formerly called Hyper Directory. This is uh, built on Hyperledger Sawtooth, as, as Rich introduced us to, and it's, it's about um, auditing. It's about compliance, and it's about making sure we know who our employees are and what they can do so that we can keep you guys as customers secure at the end of the day. Um, but let's, let's take a little bit step back from that. So what is identity? We hear that talked about a lot, right? Identity is, um, you know, maybe it's this guy. You might say he's got a unique identity. He's got tattoos and a guitar and a beanie, very Seattle, right? Um, so I looked up, the, as I started kind of preparing this presentation, I, I looked this up and, and found that this was the definition. The facts of being who or what a person or thing is. And that didn't help me at all. I, I don't know what you guys get out of that, but that did not help me at all. Um, so I, I feel, felt like it was uh, really important to dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, so what is identity? Is, is, it, um, is it this? Is it a passport, right? Is it the government saying you have this date of birth and, and this identity number? You know, is it these passports? Do you have one identity or do you have many of them? Um, is your identity this? Is it, is it your bank account? Is it the, the balances that allow you to interact with the world around you to buy things, to have a house and a car and to drive and go places? Um, you know, I think that, you know, that plays a role into who you are and how you can interact with the world around you, but I would certainly argue that that's not my identity. How about this? These, you know, the characteristics that define you, is that your identity? Um, you know, is it um, this? Is it a public key and a private key? Something that's a, right? Maybe it is. Maybe it should be. Um, and and what, was that, what would that mean for the world that we live in? Uh, and that's something that I know we've got some sovereign folks in the audience. So uh, they can certainly answer more questions. I'm not going to get super deep today into self-sovereign identity and, and how we manifest ourselves leveraging the DID network uh, in the future, but it's a really important part to, uh, a important way to think about who you are. Okay, what about trust? Let's get interactive again. Who's, who's got a definition for trust? Anybody? Anybody want free things? Trust? It's a tough one, right? It's almost as bad as identity. Nobody wants to put themselves out there. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about that guy? Do you trust him? I, to me, he looks a little salesy, and no offense to you salespeople in the audience, but um, I have a hard time looking like I can trust him too much. I'm, I'm a tech guy. Um, so trust I have defined as a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. And so, uh, you know, I looked at that and kind of had the same reaction to identity. This is one of these words that we use all the time, you know, colloquially, you, you might be able to use it in context and feel like you understand what it means. But, um, you know, what is this definition really and how, what does that mean for, for what we should think about trust and, and how does that relate to identity? You know, I know that I see that someone or something at the end of that. Um, and I think there's something to that. So, I thought more about this. I thought more about trust and started to look at how is trust manifesting in the world around us? And, and ultimately, right, we are here to talk about blockchains, don't worry. So what, is, what does trust have to do with blockchain? Um, I don't know if you had to guess. All right, again, opportunity for the audience. On a scale of what we have one to 10, where do you think this average is out? You, you've got all the bars right there. Anybody? Somewhere? Throw out a number. Somebody's got it. Seven, six and a half. Here, pass these, pass these back, would you? Um, good. Thanks for, for trying. Um, I think where we end up with on this is at 5.9. So this is trust in others in Europe. Um, and, you know, you can see it ranges from, from the Danes who, uh, you know, they, they trust each other a lot to uh, the Cypriots who don't trust each other quite so much. Uh, but the average is a 5.9. Um, when I was in school, 5.9 was a D or 
an F? I don't know. It didn't get me very far. I promise that was not a passing grade. So uh, this is something that I don't think we are rating very well. Now, some of you might be saying, that's your uh, you know, trust. We, we do much better here. So how about this one? Any guesses as to what this trend looks like? Anybody? Anybody want to want to venture a thought of what the trend line is going to be here? <laughs> here. Um, so I, I uh, didn't go so far as to put a number on this one, what I've built as a trend line, so we can all you know, just kind of imagine what that looks like. Yeah, so you know, there's a little spike there around 2001. We can maybe guess what happened. But in general, uh, public trust in the government here in the United States is on the decline. And it's significantly worse than you know, trust is amongst the others. In, in Europe, right? So, you know, less than 20% of people say they have trust in the government today. Um, that is what brings us to blockchain. What is blockchain and why should we care about it? And why is it something that businesses like T-Mobile are investing in today so that sometime down the road we can deliver solutions? And the answer is here in, in this the Bitcoin white paper that Satoshi Nakamoto released in 2008 before the launch of the Bitcoin blockchain in 2009. And I took away one key from this. That Bitcoin was proposed as an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. And that's really important. I was on a panel at Blockchain Northwest this week and I, I mentioned this and, and you know I said that um, the, the conversation was around security. And people asked, you know, are blockchains more secure than other applications? You know, I, I'm looking for a really secure solution. Should I, should I use a blockchain? And I say, if that's the question you're asking, the answer is probably not. Because while, you know, certainly you can implement a secure application leveraging blockchain, blockchain is not going to make you more secure. Blockchain is about trust. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point. And, and I think what's really important about that, as, as we understand, you know, kind of the last couple slides showed, this is emerging in a time and place where trust is at all-time lows. Right? We, we just don't have the trust uh, in our government, in public entities, in each other that people have had in history. And trust is a really important part of social equity, something that we all leverage to make sure that we can kind of live happily in this world. Um, so this is the environment that blockchain is emerging in. Now, how, how does cryptographic proof replace trust? In a lot of scenarios, and, and what Satoshi was talking about, is the proof of work or consensus amongst blockchains. You know, now, we've all probably heard that a lot of consensus mechanisms have emerged since uh, the, the Bitcoin white paper was, was introduced in 2008, right? If you're a Hyperledger guy, you know that Fabric primarily uses PBFT or GAL. Uh, you might know that Sawtooth leverages Poet or proof of elapsed time. And, and these are things that uh, you know, allow us to further this effort of um, you know, replacing trust with cryptographic proof. Consensus, as defined here, should be um, easy to prove but difficult to fake. And that's really important, right? So Satoshi said, the proof of work involves scanning for a value that when hashed, such as with SHA-256, the hash begins with a number of zero bits. And the important part is here, the average work required is exponential in the number of zero bits required and can be verified by executing a single hash. And so to the point, that is easy to prove, right? You just have to execute a single hash, but difficult to fake, exponentially so. Cryptographic proof is able to replace trust in, in blockchain models like Bitcoin, uh, but it's able to do that in a lot of different ways as well. Um, you know, one of the things you know, I've talked this year about, uh, we had a chance, you know, we are very fortunate here in Washington State to um, have a legislature and uh, a set of regulators in the Attorney General's office and the Department of Financial Institutions that are really actively engaged in the community. You know, I said that, or uh, I think in Rich's introduction, I said that, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about building this uh, community in Seattle here to be the best in the world and, and the most passionate and the most committed and, and have the best solutions around blockchain. And our government plays a big role in that. They really do. Uh, I think we've gotten kind of a bad rap. Honestly, I don't know if you guys have seen in some of the news, people have said Washington is not crypto friendly. They're not blockchain friendly. 
Uh, but I really stand on the other side of that. Um, you know, our, our government has demonstrated that they're interested in going out and learning and understanding these technologies and making sure that um, you know, they're building kind of a defined space where you can operate safely within that. And that's, that's kind of the, because these rules have been put out and they've said, you know, here's this framework you can follow. People said, well, you've got to go jump through all these hoops in Washington if you want to deploy a crypto. Well, you know, I kind of think that I would want the company that I'm trusting my financial information with, my personal information, my identity information, I would want them to feel like they need to jump through some hoops and follow some rules and you know, be the type of company that does that. So I think Washington is a great place. And, uh, and we're seeing this emerge here because we have this invested uh, kind of government and industry. Um, let's look back at identity. So I, I, I really wanted to break this down further. I, you know, I went off on that tangent and I learned about trust and how we're in a terrible environment. And oh, hey, look at that. You know, Bitcoin emerged right as this you know, kind of terrible environment has, has started, you know, this trend has started to emerge. And, um, but I didn't learn more about identity. So I tried to break this down into the fact of being who a person is and the fact of being what a thing is. That, to me, just kind of separating those two made it a little bit easier to understand. It's, it's not any of those individual things that I showed. It's not a passport number or a bank account balance or an identity characteristic that defines how you look. It's not your date of birth. Um, it's, it's the fact of being you. And that, to me, seems very different from how we treat identity today. You know, we treat it as something that, you know, the government gives us an identity and, and, you know, we're lucky to have that and that allows us to go, you know, we're privileged to go get a driver's license and drive a car and, and um, I, I don't know about that. So what about identity? How, how is identity represented? What is the business of identity, right? And I think this starts to tell the story. The market for digital advertising in 2017 was $204 billion. And 2017 marked the first year where that number surpassed that of television advertising. So this is a really interesting time. We're going through this kind of downward trend in how we trust each other and how we trust governments and companies with our identity information, yet digital advertising, which I will suggest is a business built on your identity, is skyrocketing. Um, so nearly two thirds of all digital advertising revenue in 2017 came through two companies. Not to spoil the surprise, it's Google and Facebook. Um, you know, and these are companies that look, I, I use their products, I um, you know, certainly participate in this ecosystem myself and I'm sure most or all of you do in some way or another as well. But I think it's important for us to understand that it is a business of, and our identity is what's getting us, you know, paying for us to play with these businesses. Um, you know, so Google in 2017, their ad revenue was nearly $96 billion and Facebook's was nearly $40 billion. That's, you know, two-thirds of, of that 200 and some billion dollars. Um, and that's, that's pretty significant. So. How do we do something about that? Where do these two worlds intersect with the emergence of you know, our identity being leveraged to make companies all this money and trust going by the wayside? Well, what I'll argue is that there are two sides of identity that we need to look at that both play a part in this. And one is the who or what you are, and the other is what you can do. So what's the answer? How does blockchain blockchain help us address this question of who or what you are? Well, the solution to that identity problem is self-sovereign identity. The same way that people start physical life by having a birth certificate, people should start digital life with a self-sovereign identity, says Gartner, and they're involving a digital identity. Um, you see that we have some representations from a little company called Sovereign who they're up there in the top left. Now, I don't know, or in the top right as you look at it. I don't know what you know about quadrants. Top right is where you want to be. That's the good one, always. So you, you got to expect that Sovereign is doing some things right, being up in Gartner's top right quadrant there. The, this is a World Economic Forum paper. Um, Self-sovereign identity is, is, is this fundamental human rights thing. It, it, 
It's a change in the way we think about who we are. Never before in human history have we been able to say, I am me. And that's what self-sovereign identity allows. Always previously, somebody has said, you are you. Whether it's a bank who holds that, your identity information and, and lets you interact with a debit card to present yourself to the world as having some finances. Whether it's a government who gives you an identity number, or a birth certificate, or a driver's license and allows you to present that in order to drive your car or you know, get into a bar or buy alcohol if you're of age, right? Um, these are other people saying who you are. Self-sovereign identity, and again, we've, we've got some great folks from Sovereign in here who I'm sure would be happy to answer all the questions around self-sovereign identity. I can talk to you about it all day as well. But it really is this opportunity for the first time in human history, right as we're entering the, this kind of point of the lowest trust we've ever had in those around us and, and in the public institutions that support us, to replace that trust with cryptographic proof. We can use things like verifiable claims, which the World Wide Web Consortium has a working group that I'm a part of that works on building a system of implementing verifiable claims that can leverage the self-sovereign identity networks to um, prove that you know, you got this degree from a university or you, you know, took this course or got this certification. And, and by writing that to a chain, it takes the ability away for somebody to revoke that from you in the future. Now, you can imagine if you're, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody in the audience earlier about, uh, you know, the challenges in the refugee crisis and how there are people who speak up uh, when there are governments that don't like the way they speak. And oftentimes the result of that is their identity is taken from them. The documents that control who they are, the, that, you know, driver's license and birth certificate and that college degree suddenly are not theirs anymore. When, that's, when you take ownership of that, leveraging self-sovereign identity, it changes the way that the world has an opportunity to interact with each other. So this is something that I think is, is really cool, right? Um, it, it's just a different way that we can interact with the world. So I'm excited to see these technologies emerging that allow us to implement solutions leveraging this. And one of the things that you know, is, is important is that it does foster variety in every way. So we'll see a proliferation of identity here. You know, multiple um, uh, identity verifiers for each of these identity networks, multiple um, identity networks out there available to participate in, right? Sovereign isn't the only one. Sorry, guys. Um, there are others. And, and multiple identities per individual who participates in this system. Uh, um, T Labs, by the way, who is in town hosting the hackathon uh, in a couple of weeks here at the end of the month, is a founding steward of the Sovereign Network. And so we're really passionate about driving forward this technology that can shift the way that people interact with each other and interact with institutions that previously have, have kind of controlled their identity information and try to giving people control of their identity for the first time. Um, so Sovereign, for those of you who aren't aware, Sovereign uh, is an identity network. Hyperledger Indy is the Hyperledger project where that code is being released. So um, you know, as, as a member of the Hyperledger family, we're, we're super excited to support their work and think that they're doing a great job of building a self-sovereign identity network and, and the, everything that goes along with it. And, and you know, they, they certainly should get plenty of uh, uh, credit for helping drive the whole movement forward and, and being a big part of that conversation as it emerges. So the other side of that coin, though, was what you can do. Uh, that's something that's really important to me, right? So I, I come from T-Mobile and the Cloud Center of Excellence, and, and here we manage a lot of identity information. It's really important to us when the auditors from Sarbanes-Oxley or you know, PCI DSS compliance come in, the payment card industry, right? Come in and say, hey, you, know, you need to be able to prove that you know who has access to what in your company. How did they get that access? When did they get that access? You know, did the person that give it to them have the authority to? Was, was the access given to this person the right one based on the request that was generated? Right? All this information that auditors come in and correlate. And, and today is extremely cumbersome and extremely expensive to process and report on. So I started looking at, you know, I, I built a 
couple generations of this solution where we manage our identity and our role-based access control to allow T-Mobile's cloud business to scale to those tens of thousands of nodes. And, and it worked pretty well, but I started to see over a couple years of running that infrastructure where there were challenges in it and started to look at next generation solutions to fill the gap. Off the shelf components that could help me you know, do better than what I'm doing, uh, you know, bespoke solutions, and ultimately blockchain came around with this capability and this promise of data immutability and non-repudiatable transactions. And these are things that spoke to me from an auditing and compliance standpoint, right? Immutability means that once that data is written, it can't be changed. That's a big deal for auditing, right? Traditionally in audit, we, we look at change logs, right? That aggregate to a log server probably somewhere and that syslog server uh, then has a, a change management application that's kind of wrapped around it to make sure it's not being tampered with. And you know, that change management system has, I don't know, probably administrators there that, well, they could change the change management. And so you get this problem that we call who's watching the watchers. And you kind of kick the can down the road in IT security, but ultimately you've got to say we've, you know, you've got to kind of cut off somewhere and say, well, you know, we've got technological solutions, we've got policy solutions. The people ultimately who have the keys at the end of the day are, you know, we we check what they do regularly, but we have to trust that they're doing, following the policies and doing things the right way. There's that trust word again. So. Blockchain and the immutability of transactions has an opportunity to remove some of that trust. And that makes our business more efficient when we go to audit. As transactions become non-repudiatable, right, once a transaction has been committed, we can confirm that it was valid and has been committed in an appropriate way and you can't reverse that transaction. That's pretty important. Um, so this allows us, Next Directory is a solution, and we'll start now talking a little bit about the architecture, what this is and how it works and why we're doing it. Um, any questions before I dig in a little bit more from a technological perspective about identity and trust and how that's emerging? Awesome. Yeah. An example of Like a real world example of, of how T-Mobile is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so a real world example of how we're leveraging blockchain in this. This is what we're doing. And so I'll, I'll talk all about that. Um, you know, this is an opportunity for us, as I mentioned, to improve the reliability of our audit data. An organization like T-Mobile, there was a statistic I read a couple years ago. Uh, no, I'm sorry, a couple of months ago. This was a 2017 statistic, so it's f fairly um, relevant and recent. And effectively, it said that um, amongst enterprises of over 10,000 employees, the average spend to audit identity and access management information was north of $2 million a year. That's a lot of money. And I can tell you T-Mobile has a lot more than 10,000 employees. Auditing identity management is expensive. And if we can reduce those costs, through things like immutability and non-repudiatable transactions and, and trust, you know, remove trust from the process of verifying that our employees only have access to the right resources, we can reduce the cost there and turn that around and reduce the cost for you guys as customers. So that's really important, right? This is, this is a back office technology that will ultimately allow our business to be more efficient and turn that around and provide new services and reduce costs at the end of the day. This is not today operational at T-Mobile. So we're in, we rolled this out uh, in its initial version last fall as a proof of concept. We worked with Intel, the Hyperledger group to um, launch this. You see it's hosted under the Hyperledger project on GitHub. This is something that we anticipate being in our production environment um, in the first half of next year. We will be running this production parallel most likely this calendar year. So we started by building the proof of concept, as is a pretty good idea in this space, and just kind of proving out that you know, this technology has the ability to do what we want it to do and ultimately improve the efficiency of our business and our technology solutions. Uh, have you had to present any of this stuff to an auditor, to a real auditor yet, and what, the, what's their reaction to it? 
Yeah, the question was, have I had the ability to present this to an auditor yet? And what's their reaction to it? Uh, and what I'll say to that is, without naming names, there are four big audit companies. And I work very closely with at least three of those. I talk to auditors from those companies most days. Not only about how my existing infrastructure is implemented and, and the controls and the processes that are wrapped around those to make sure our business stays safe. Because you know, I'm not just a blockchain guy, right? This is, this is my part of T-Mobile's business, is making sure our information is, is auditable. Um, and, and that's how I came to blockchain, right? It, it was not a answer looking for a problem. This was my problem space that, that blockchain is the answer for. Um, and, and so I have conversations with them every day about audit and how this solution is emerging to address the challenges we see today. This is a direct solution to the problems that I ran into working with those audit agencies every day. as opposed to another blockchain solution? Great, yeah, as far as selection process goes, I think that's a really good question. And we can definitely talk about that right now. And, and I'll, um, let, me, let me move to the next slide. We can start to look at kind of some of the architecture and, and I'll talk about selection. So there are uh, a lot of criteria any organization should look at as they're evaluating technologies to solve problems in their business, right? And blockchain should be considered no different from any other technology you're looking to layer into an architectural stack. At the end of the day, as an architect like I am, I'm not looking at how I can, you know, force this new technology into my systems because it's cool. What I want to do is end up with an architecture at the end of the day that addresses the business case, does so efficiently, is able to prove its return on investment for my BP and my boss who paid for me to build things like this, and, and that um, you know, makes things better. Um, and, but it doesn't need to be, you know, it's not holistic. It's not like you, what you don't see is, you know, for instance, with the Bitcoin blockchain, the Venn diagram of the application to the blockchain looks like this, right? It's completely one over the other. The application in the blockchain are inherently tied together. Um, blockchain doesn't need to be that way. And that's one of the conversations I have regularly with people is that blockchain can be a part of an architecture. It can add a characteristic to a solution, to an application at the end of the day. And that's how we evaluate, you know, the same thing if, if I want to make a decision between a, a relational and a NoSQL database type for a particular solution, you look at the benefits of one, the benefits of the other, how much it costs, the, the skills that your company has, right? That's really important because maybe it's, it's uh, you can be, um, you could build a solution 5% faster with this new technology and it, it just makes it a little easier, right? Whatever it is. But, you've got guys that know the old technology, gals that know the old technology, and they're really efficient with it. Is, are you actually gonna take advantage of getting more efficiency out of 5% gain from a new solution that you don't know versus building on the one that you do? And that's relevant because when we selected Hyperledger Sawtooth, it was important to be able to write smart contract code and write against the blockchain in languages that we knew that we could work in. When you look at solutions like Ethereum, uh, you know, to write a smart contract, you're effectively looking at writing Solidity code. I don't know how many of you have worked in Solidity. I wouldn't call it a developer's dream language. It's got some real challenges. And beyond just having challenges, it's a brand new language we're still learning about. And we're seeing examples, very, very expensive public examples, of how that process of using a language that people aren't familiar with costs a lot of money. All right, who out there knows of some examples that have cost people a lot of money in the last few years leveraging Solidity? Yeah. What do we got? Parity multi-sig. That's one of the biggest one, right? Everybody heard about the parity multi-sig hack? Uh, you know, it seemed like such a great idea as they implemented this wallet, but boy, that didn't quite work out the way they had hoped. Um, so that's, yeah, just a, a bad implementation. Um, what else? Anybody? Yeah, one more in the back. What do you got? The DAO. The DAO. Absolutely. That's another of the big ones, right? You know, the DAO was a big enough deal, if you're not familiar with it, that uh, when, when the DAO hack went through, 
Um, for, so for those who don't know, how many, can I see a show of hands real quick? Who knows what the DAO is and the DAO hack? All right, we, we've got a handful, so I'll just take a minute. So excuse me for those who know. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, for those who don't, this is just kind of an interesting story. Um, so the DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And the concept is that you can build this organization on a blockchain, allow smart contracts to kind of uh, own all of the finances and processes around this business. And there's no person who, who can make these decisions for this organization. It's decentralized and autonomous. Wow, it's really cool. It's, it's the future of a company. Um, unfortunately, the Dow didn't do that good of a job securing all this money that they raised. And somewhere along the line, what was this, 2016, mid-2016, they lost, I don't know, 50, 60 million dollars. Whoops, that's not good. Uh, it was a big enough deal that Ethereum, the uh, blockchain platform of choice for the Dow, decided you know, in, in all their wisdom that we are actually going to fork our own blockchain, roll back, and give the DAO back their money. Ethereum that you know and love today is a fork of the original Ethereum blockchain. The original Ethereum blockchain still exists. Maybe you see it if you've uh, opened up Coinbase lately. It's called Ethereum Classic. I don't know, it trades at like a couple bucks, right? So Ethereum, has, has kind of turned on its head, and the DAO hack itself had turned on its head this concept of blockchain immutability, right? And they actually said, yeah, that was a big deal. You know, that immutability thing, we're just going to fudge it a little bit, roll back, hard fork, split this off, let them have their money. Um, so there are great examples of how leveraging languages in a secure space that you're not all that familiar with and tools that you're not all that familiar with can be a big problem. So again, a blockchain like Sawtooth that allows you to take advantage of writing your code in Python or C or something else that you're more familiar with, that's a pretty important decision. Um, other decisions around how you decide to implement, you know, consensus, right? We talked about consensus as that replacement for cryptographic or that replacement leveraging cryptographic proof for trust. So it seems important then that the consensus algorithm you're leveraging is suited to the task at hand and to the infrastructure that you're looking to deploy, the partners or individuals that are participate in that for you know, a public chain where you wanna have a anonymous network of untrusted hosts, then you know, you're gonna wanna probably leverage proof of work. Now other consensus algorithms are emerging, proof of stake is relatively untrusted, proof of work has demonstrated its own issues but is effectively kind of mostly unscathed from the last several years and, and still holds over $100 billion of value on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's, it does fairly well. Um, if you're looking at you know, private chains though, again, you're gonna be looking at different decisions on what consensus algorithm is important and that might lead you to deciding on what blockchain you wanna use. Uh, most often blockchains are built tied to their consensus algorithm. Most blockchains out there, you, you use Bitcoin, you're using proof of work as a consensus algorithm. If you use Ethereum, you're using, uh, well, proof of work-ish also and, and kind of migrating towards proof of stake. Um, but with Sawtooth, maybe you want to use PBFT like Hyperledger Fabric does instead of Poet, their own consensus algorithm that they've developed. Sawtooth allows that flexibility. And that was a big part of the decision making for me to build this application on Sawtooth is that based on how this application emerges, we could potentially swap the consensus algorithm that's being used to make decisions around this chain. Um, you can actually write a, um, uh, change the consensus algorithm on the fly with a proposal to the network. Uh, so that's a pretty cool capability. Um, Poet in and of itself is a big part of decision making. This is really cool. How many of you know what uh, uh, a trusted execution environment is? Anybody? I see a couple hands kind of appearing on the edges. Um, a lot of you have used these, whether you know it or not. Your phone might have a trusted execution environment in it. Your desktop computer at home might have a trusted execution environment. Also called an Oncave or um, you know, a specific technology that's implemented against that would be Intel's SGX or Software Guard Extensions. Um, a trusted execution environment is like, how do I describe this? Um, 
it's like a, it's a reverse sandbox. So you know your browser, they say, runs in a sandbox, right? And what that means is the code that runs in your browser, if there's malicious code being run there, theoretically, it shouldn't impact your operating system. It's contained in that sandbox. With a reverse sandbox, it's just the opposite. The code that's running in your operating system, theoretically, shouldn't be able to impact what's running in your trusted execution environment. And that hardware on cave allows you to do things like encrypt data or run leader election processes in ways that previously were unavailable by running them in hardware in this trusted execution environment. So the POET consensus algorithm, um, Hyperledger Sawtooth, by the way, was uh, primarily developed and donated to Hyperledger by the Intel Corporation. And Intel um, builds this fantastic hardware on cave called SGX. And, and Poet leverages SGX to do just that. They move leader election into hardware, into this trusted enclave. You can speed up the process then. It effectively, it's called proof of elapsed time because you're kind of using a random number generator to draw the short straw. It goes really fast. And you can do it in a more trusted way. Um, so that's really cool. And that's an important part of kind of some of the decision making around selecting your blockchain. So long-winded answer. Hope it provided some value. Any, any questions or thoughts around that? Yeah. Running SGX and T-Mobile? Great question. The question was, uh, do you have any concerns about building a hardware solution or a, a blockchain solution that's tied to hardware? Um, and the answer is, well, yeah, absolutely. You should have concerns around that. And you should know what, what that means as you're developing against it. So um, there are a couple of ways now that you can get access to SGX and leverage the capabilities of this hardware on Cave. Uh, you can certainly buy SGX chips. Some of the latest generation of Intel processors have this technology available. You can deploy systems with that, build on top of it, and take advantage. Uh, a new thing that was announced, I think, two weeks ago or uh, just recently is that uh, Azure now has a VM type that sits on top of SGX hardware. So they call this Azure Confidential Computing. And uh, you can go look up a, a, the blog post about the launch of that and what's going on in that space. But we were a part of that at T-Mobile. And we were a part of the early testing and development against that. And we're looking to leverage Azure Confidential Computing in the next identity platform. And I'll, I'll still talk a little bit about this architecture. I'll get there, I promise. Um, and uh, so let me just check the time. Good. Um, yeah, hard, you know, tying yourself to hardware is a concern. now. Um, by having an opportunity to deploy in the cloud against that hardware that does take away some of the concerns about running it in your own data centers and things like that. Uh, but again, remember that Sawtooth is built not with a uh, single consensus algorithm that's intrinsic to the chain, but an opportunity to swap consensus algorithms. So if I built a Sawtooth application and then decided that, you know what, gosh, this whole SGX thing, uh, well, I think it's going to be fantastic. But if an organization were to decide that it, this isn't working out, it's not doing what we want, we're not liking this, we got to move to different hardware. Maybe you know, corporate on high made the decision that we're moving off of Azure and confidential computing, and we're moving over to AWS, and, and they don't have it. Um, great, you can swap the consensus algorithm. You can run, there's a, a, a software um, emulated version of Poet. You can move to PBFT. You can do other things. So. Um, yeah, I think you should be conscious of the challenges that might be attached to implementing a, a solution that's tied to hardware and make sure that you know what you're getting into as you do that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, question. Who runs the nodes of the, that Sawtooth network? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, Sawtooth is primarily a private blockchain solution. You could deploy this in a... Uh, consortium of partners, so you know you could imagine people who want to share identity information amongst each other, each hosting a node of this, and able to have multi-party right that handles you know race conditions and and double spend problems and all those kind of things like like blockchains are able to do. Um, in our in 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 for T-Mobile's purposes, this is an entirely private blockchain solution. Um, this is something where we own and run all of the nodes. And the first question I get when I say that to people is. Well, then, how is that immutable? 
if you own all of the nodes, you can just at the same time submit you know, to each of those chains the, an opportunity to roll back and they all agree on it and you move forward and that wasn't really immutable, was it? Well, you know, I mean, there are uh, those drawbacks. However, there are great solutions to that. There are great um, mitigations. Like I said, with any enterprise application architecture, you need to be understand, understanding of the capabilities of the system, the shortcomings of it, and how you might mitigate those shortcomings and build something that ultimately allows you to make your business more efficient, right? That's what this is all about, right? It's not about implementing blockchain, it's about making your business run better. Um, at least at T-Mobile it often is, you know, saving money for our customers. And so you can do things like trust anchoring, where you take a hash of your chain at a cadence every week, every day, hour, minute, whatever you want, hash the whole thing and fire that up to a public chain. Well, now there's a public record of what the state of your chain was at X, X and X point in time, and you're able to go back, and if somebody wants to say, you know, I don't trust that you haven't just rolled this back, it's a private blockchain, you can go, well, look, let's hash that period of time, and here's what the hash is, and go reference the, the uh, public chain record of, of what the hash should have been at the time, and look, they match, great. That's called trust anchoring, and that gives you an ability to mitigate some of the challenges with um, uh, you know, trust and immutability around a private chain solution. Again, not perfect. There's always, you know, everything is a trade-off in architectures. And so, you know, maybe if we want to get really geeky, maybe this is getting past the, the two-star rating, but, you know, maybe at that point you would go, well, but then what if somebody implements an, an Ethereum eclipse attack against you? And so they, you know, an Ethereum eclipse attack, right, where you, you block out the sun of the greater Ethereum network with your own malicious nodes. It's kind of like a man in the middle, but you got to do a whole bunch of them so that, you know, the, the person who has this private chain thinks that they're connecting to Ethereum to write this immutable data, but ha-ha, you know, they're not. Well, okay, all right, fine. You know, there's, you need to understand the architectural choices that you're making, the mitigations for those, and, you know, the overall security, right? And these are all things that weigh into decision-making on a solution. No one thing together defines how you make a choice. Everything in security is about trade-offs, and, and uh, that's a really important space to be aware of. Uh, one thing that I like to highlight as this type of question emerges is it's really important for us to understand these things at T-Mobile. And so we work hand in hand with our digital security organization in the Cloud Center of Excellence. We uh, have partnered on this application to bring in some of those unnamed huge auditors that you know to do penetration tests against the solution, to do code reviews against the solution, to do threat vectoring against the solution, and make sure that we understand the challenges and the risks associated with the decisions that we're making. So, yeah. Questions? How much social engineering do you consider when you look at risk factors versus just simply sort of the, the architectural level? But thinking about the different ways that social engineering could interfere with sure. best laid plans. Yeah, social engineering is certainly a big challenge for businesses, especially those like T-Mobile where we face, um, you know, a lot of customers, right? Tens and tens of millions of customers. Um, it's really important to us to make sure that we build solutions that mitigate the risks affiliated with social engineering, whether it's phishing of email accounts or otherwise. That's why we do a lot of these things like put scam likely on your phone when you get a call from this number that's been registered to the network, right? So that's really important to us at T-Mobile. Even against your employees, though, the social engineering. Yeah, and, and that's something that, you know, you take that into consideration in, in your solution design. That There is a threat vector there. It's not, you know, generally what we'll do is we'll analyze that, give it a, uh, a, a risk threshold value, and connect a finding number to that risk threshold and look at it overall compiled into the risk of the application. You know, so there's a, a kind of mature and methodical process around looking at overall architectures and deciding that. And I think other organizations that they look to implement blockchain and other, any solution should do the same thing. You should have a mature process around understanding the risks affiliated with the design decisions you make and you know, kind of surfacing those and making sure that you're making informed choices. So there's, there's no perfect solution. You can just kind of understand and try to make solutions or make choices that are best. Yeah. So oh, two there. So when you're saying that if you take a hash um, to audit and upload it, if it, if it changes at all, 
Yeah. Is there any way to go back and see what was changed? What was, if that did happen? Uh, if the question is, uh, there's no way to get from the hash back to the data, right? Um, so if, if say we were doing trust anchoring and you know somebody went to audit us and they're like, well, let's you know compare this trust anchor point to what the hash should have been for the blockchain at that point, and oh, it's different. You're not in a very good way for trust. Yeah, that's that's not something you want to have happen. So you want to make sure that you're building solutions and decisions that mitigate that. And that's that's about being, you know, that's that's doing what it's supposed to. It's about kind of taking the trust out of the process and forcing it into this verifiable mechanism. And so that as a business, it's we're inclined to make sure we're following the rules. Now that's something that we do, but you know, everybody's heard of Enron and other folks who maybe made decisions that weren't quite following the rules. So yeah. All right, one more. So, so you guys, the next is a is a RBAC solution. Yeah. Is it basically going to sit behind Active Directory, or would it replace yeah. Active Directory? Yeah. So let's. That's a great question. Next is an RBAC system. Does it sit behind Active Directory? Does it replace our Active Directory? Let's talk about this. Okay. So, uh, and I see there's a, actually a couple of guys from my team in the audience, a couple of folks here tonight. So uh, maybe I'll call them out and pester them um, a little bit later, but. Yeah. Know about um, so your identity validator right now with your initial deployment when you're running this in parallel with Active Directory are yeah. you using a federated or are you going with a self-sovereign for federated or self-sovereign okay perfect we'll we'll touch on those so let's start to talk about this architecture and kind of some of the things that we're doing and why um, so first off this is a pretty high level architecture it's it's got a, a pretty close. Um, connection to the reality of the application, but you know there's some uh, let's call it poetic license taken just to make a nice clean image for people to look at. Um, but the idea again here is that this is an enterprise application where a blockchain is a component of it. Uh, we have a UI sitting on the front end. Today, the UI that's in GitHub, again, you can go find all this code and, and download it today and play with it, is, is built on Angular 2. Uh, but we're actually moving to a new UI. I'll show you some screens from that in just a second that's built on React. Um, you know, again, kind of these are choices that you make when you're building applications. Um, and these are traditional technologies. They're not blockchains. Uh, that UI interfaces with a RESTful API layer. Uh, we use OpenAPI Swagger, another Linux Foundation technology, to uh, kind of stitch together our you know, interfaces with the application. Uh, generally speaking, um, API layer should be kind of the only way in and out of your blockchain application, one way in, one way out. That makes a lot of sense, and it makes it easy to keep track of things and make sure that you're doing it right. Um, so we see that API engine. You could potentially integrate directly. Um, and let me take a step back and answer your question first. Uh, where does this sit in relation to Active Directory? Well, I am going to deploy this solution underneath Active Directory as a source of truth where Active Directory will read data from Next and reflect that and almost act in a kind of read-only mode where you don't make write changes to AD. Um, this could be deployed in a number of different environments in different ways, and I'll touch on those real quick. Imagine you're in a green field where you've got a new company, you're building this modern high-speed web app, you want to use you know, some role-based access control, some identity management to, to handle what you're doing. Um, you might just want to use the RESTful API interface to plug into this, right? You don't want to use LDAP or something you know, like that where you would traditionally have to build a complex integration. You use the tools that are available today. You plug into the API engines, make you know, uh, post and get requests, and, and ta-da, you know, you've got your identity information that you're interacting with. So we've got on the left-hand side applications that are represented as integrating directly to the API engine. But you know, in that case, it could be you know, potentially a quote-unquote replacement for Active Directory. Now, that's a very limited replacement. What Next does? A user is how you represented plug this in, in the back here. end of, of yeah. Active Directory. A user is represented in here by a public key and a private key. Um, now, we have a user and a group object, and we also, what this is really about is users and group objects as far as Active Directory is related. There's also some other object types we have. Uh, approval is the other big part of this. You know, Active Directory doesn't have any kind of concept of approval built into it. So it's important for us to ha know not only who you are and what you can do, but how you got the ability to do that. So those are all on chain. Um, these objects are built with a very limited number of, of static properties, things that are really central to what the application can do. 
but uh, are, they have a, basically a JSON blob property field. So as many attributes as you want to extend and replicate from the schema of Active Directory, you want to take every one of the however many properties you've got today, plus all the custom ones that your organization hacked into the schema. Uh, great, plug them all into the JSON blob property field. You can extend your implementation of Next to reflect exactly what you want it to reflect. For us, you know, we're leveraging a fairly minimal set of properties that we're cloning over. Um, so the integration engine provides kind of two outputs, and my team has actually been sitting over on a Microsoft campus all week working with Microsoft engineers on building these integration components. If you go look at the GitHub repo right now, you'll see our project board and our issues backlogs are all issues around building these components, and the most recent PRs from today and yesterday were building these components. Um, so we went to find some of the best people in the world to support us in building these. They know Active Directory and Azure Active Directory pretty well. And um, they've, we've been building um, two different identity providers that will allow you to integrate either or both to um, Azure Active Directory to via Graph API to consume identity, to share identity, both get and give identity information, or via LDAP to more traditional directory services like on-prem Active Directory. Does that answer your questions there? Awesome. Did that get way too technical for everybody? Yeah, okay, cool. So, you know, we've got at least one Active Directory guy in the audience, that's great. That's, that's my background, I was an Active Directory guy, so I, I'm all into that stuff. Um, but yeah, so we've got this API engine and it can integrate to the existing directory services you might have if you're an enterprise like T-Mobile where you know, we need to, we've got a, dozens of applications that are integrated to Active Directory. I'm not gonna cut it out of my org chart and my organizational structure anytime in the near future. Plus it handles computer objects so users can authenticate to computers and it handles group policy to make sure that security is enforced across those, right? Active Directory does a lot of things that Next does not or will not. What it does do is manage users and groups in an immutable, non-repudiatable way and prove the transactions that do that. It allows you to take the business processes that you use in your company to define how identity transactions should occur and enforce them in code. Um, we've got RethinkDB. What's a streaming database doing in a blockchain? Isn't blockchain supposed to do that for you? Eh, no, kind of, I mean, not really. Look, blockchain, again, gives us the ability in this solution to gain immutability and non-repudiatability transactions and, and gain those characteristics in the application architecture. RethinkDB does other things for us. It allows us to have an extremely high-speed read interface that we can interact with from our API layer as, as we have you know, tens of thousands of users going in to consume identity information. Most of the time, that's just, you know, what groups am I in, what can I do? And, and so we, we wanted to have a solution that was able to mitigate some of the challenges of a purely blockchain architecture and provide more capability and more scalability than traditional solutions would. Um, that uses a custom ledger sync to write back then to the Sawtooth blockchain where we've got the different components that participate in that. So um, any, any questions, thoughts? My team, Adam, Keith, how did I do, what? Did I, tell, did I tell them lies? I get thumbs up. All right, good. No, we're excited about this. We are, uh, we're making tons of commits every day. We love that this is an open source project. And so T-Mobile is not, um, you know, there's a couple types of open source and I just want to be cognizant of my time. 5.30, I'm doing okay. Um, there's a couple different types of open source you can look at. One of them is, um, you know, a company like T-Mobile spends a bunch of time, we build a product, we polish it, we run it through legal, we run it through communications, and we just drop all the source code out and people go, okay, I can get that for free now. But there's no commit history, there's no design decisions, how do you know, you know, if you're not, you know, the kind of dev, you know, core dev who wants to go pour through the repo to understand what this application does, how are you gonna get any information about it? So we've tried to make that easier. We commit in the open. We put our issue backlog in the open. We have our stand-up. How, how many of you guys do stand-up at your companies? Any, any dev shops around here? We see a couple people, right? Our daily stand-up where, where our dev team gets together and talks about what we're working on, what we've completed, what's coming up next. Uh, that's, we post that to the Hyperledger chat every day. So anybody can join from the community and be a part of this project as it grows. And we've got folks like Intel and Microsoft working on this with us every day, or as it seems appropriate, as, as the need arises, to make this the best solution for our business and for other businesses out there. 
Um, so we want to do this in, this in this second type of open source where everything is open as possible, right? All the communication between our, our developers and our team happens in Hyperledger chat, right? You can hit chat.hyperledger.org and there's a Sawtooth Next directory channel and you will see, you know, there's, we're not hiding the warts here. And, you know, the, the what the heck did you do there to, hey, let's go to stand up, here's the link today to, you know, Whatever it is, it's there in chat for people to connect to, search through, see the past when people have asked questions about it. Uh, other Hyperledger projects, by the way, right? This is a Hyperledger meetup. Um, have a presence in Hyperledger chat and the core devs, I'm sure the indie folks are, have the same experience. The people who are building these applications, making these design decisions, putting together the architectures are engaged daily in chat. You can go and ask the questions and participate in those communities very easily. Hyperledger is fantastic for that. So that's really great. Um, this is a, a sample of the UI that we're rolling out in the near term future. This is the next generation one, right? We built that POC UI in Angular 2. This will be the one that we're putting together in React. And you can see all of the UI backlog items that are there, all the commits going in around this, building out the infrastructure and the tooling to support it, the end-to-end -end testing, all those things that you need to build a really good enterprise application that people feel like they can trust. Don't worry, it's open source. You don't have to trust it. You can go verify. Um, and, uh, and so this will allow us to manage our users and our businesses and make it easier for people to get access to the things they do. Um, you know, we call it conversational UI because it is. There's, there's a chat element to it. You can integrate that potentially to things like Slack or Alexa, right? And make this something that people use in the way that they're using other solutions today. Make it easier for them to get access to the things they need access to and easier for us as a business then to audit all of that information at the end of the day. That's what Next Directory is really about. It's about making it easier to get access to the stuff and making it easier to audit who had access when. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. I like this. This is just a little bit of a relationship map. Of kind of So Linux Foundation sits on top and Hyperledger is a project underneath that. What I like about this is that it shows what an awesome community we are, both in Hyperledger. You know, we've got the indie folks here today supporting me, and, and we have a lot of conversations around you know, how these technologies might play off each other in the future, um, but also these other Linux Foundation um, technologies, right? You're familiar with Open API. We're using Open API Swagger. You're familiar with Linux. We're using Linux, right? Uh, Rethink DB, Node. Uh, there's a huge family of Linux Foundation technologies. Uh, I suggest you go check them out because they're really capable solutions like Rocket Chat that you can get for free and make your business run a little better. Um, and, and so we're leveraging a lot of those as we build next. And, and so we're not just, uh, you know, kind of. Um, a Hyperledger project because we are, because they have all these capabilities that they can help contribute to what we do. And we want to give what we're doing back to that community. Yeah. So um, I think that's, that's what I had today. You know, I, I want to close by just inviting you to think about T-Mobile a little differently. We're, we're really excited right now. Maybe you've been a customer for a long time, like some people up front here were. Uh, maybe you're not a customer. Um, T-Mobile, if you're not aware, in the last like five years ago, we brought in this new CEO, this guy named John Ledger. <sighs> Let me, t oh man, I don't even have enough words, but he's fantastic. The company, the company has absolutely turned on its head since he joined. We were, and I will be you know, the first to admit, in the bottom of the barrel in almost every measurable category from service quality to speed to customer service, like you name it. And we now lead the industry in like every one of those categories, right? We have been on a tear for the last several years of having the highest customer satisfaction, the lowest churn, the highest speed available to our users. And we're just getting started. And technology transformation is a huge part of that, right? The way that we leverage technology, the way that we leverage blockchain and other emerging technologies to make our business run more efficient is a big part of that, right? We can give you that telemarketing likely and that scam likely because of technology. And so technology is not just one of those kind of buzzwords that we're, you know, we're going through technology transformation, right? It's something that we really believe in. We believe that transforming wireless is gonna happen through technology innovation. And so you'll hear all the way up to our C-suite, our leadership talking about that. 
and, and then all the way down to you know, my humble level. Uh, that's something that we believe and we implement every day. We build solutions and we talk, come to events like this to talk about the solutions we build. And we give them away to the community as open source software because it's what's allowing us to transform our business and we want you guys to be able to do the same thing. So T-Mobile, think about us a little differently. Think of us as a technology company who has a business in wireless because that's who we are today. And uh, thanks for coming out and listening. Any, any questions last? Last call, yeah. What do you got in the back? Thank you. Ah, you've already got one. You already got another? Yeah. Uh, he had another thing, so. There you go. <laughs> you've clearly levered Hyperledger very well to uh, do this. I'm curious, um, you obviously don't have accurate numbers, but how much time have you put into this project, and how much time do you think Hyperledger has saved you to, by, by using Hyperledger to put this together? Uh, that's a good question. Um, how much time have we put into this project? How much time has it saved us by using Hyperledger? Um, so this has been a little bit of a stop-start effort, right? We haven't just, we are, um, my team right now that's working on this, Keith and Adam who are in the room, we're in sprint four right now. Sprint's two weeks for us, so that's a couple months of work. Now, there was something that existed before we started this sprint cycle. Um, you know, that POC that we built. So that POC, uh, effectively last year, um, I came up with this concept of how blockchain might be applied to my business, the identity access management, role-based access control we have implemented, and looked at solutions, like I said, off-the-shelf solutions, bespoke solutions, and kind of came to blockchain as this potential solution. And I started looking at, you know, what's the right blockchain? I asked all those questions that I talked about. What kind of skills do we have in-house that could be brought to bear? What kind of um, you know, challenges might we face with this? What are the decisions that will impact how this runs in the future, consensus algorithms? And, and we landed on Sawtooth. And when we did that, we then reached out to Intel and said, well, Intel, you guys built this. We'd love to collaborate with you on, on building something together. We think it's a really great use of your platform. And they said, sweet, let's do it. So we both kind of worked in separate. We built a swagger, basically, that was kind of the backbone of this application and had Intel go off and build kind of some of the on-chain stuff that they're most familiar with. We went and built the other half of it that we're more familiar with, the kind of use case and how people will interact with it, and, uh, and stitched it together. We worked, you know, we each had a, a couple of sprints, basically, worth of work to put the POC together. Um, and then and, and that was that. So it, without putting a number or dollar value on it, right, it's the kind of thing that, um, I'll be honest, today we talk a lot about blockchain technology and not a lot about blockchain use cases and applications. Here, go install this, make your business better. Well, that's what we're working on with Next. But today, you're still building custom solutions, right? So we're in the early stages of this nascent industry's growth. And over the coming months and years, you will start to see more off-the-shelf applications that you can just go clone a repo and build it, or go download it and, and install it. Um, but yeah, you know what I can say is that, you know, uh, it's, it's the opportunity with this application in our business is enough that uh, it certainly outweighs the costs we've put into it thus far and will put into it. You know, we keep making the choice that this is, is worth investing in for us. So you know, I think that's a pretty good place to be. Uh, I think it's fair to say that you know, I'm putting my money and my eggs in the basket of moving this forward and think it will continue to prove itself to be worthwhile. And we've had great partners and folks like Hyperledger and Intel and Microsoft who have put some eggs in the same basket and said, yeah, let's, let's move this thing forward. So we're excited about it. Yeah. Any questions? Anybody else? Anybody just want a Tumblr? Anybody who didn't get a Tumblr, feel free to come up and grab one. Yeah, great. <laughs>